Real estate investment practice problem using OneNote. Break even point part one. Get ready because we're going to be raising the stakes with real estate. Here we are in OneNote. If you have access to OneNote, would like to follow along, you're not required to, but if would like to, we're in the icon left hand side. Practice problems tab down in the 4200 points break even point part one tab. Also note, when using OneNote, take a look at the Immersive Reader tool. Our practice problems will also be in the text area with the same name, same number, but with transcripts. Transcripts that can be translated into multiple different languages and either listened to or read in them. Closing the icon, we got the information up top, calculations on down below. In prior presentations, we focused in on points, tools that we can use to analyze whether purchasing points would be beneficial or not and to be able to compare points and non-points, or for example, two different loans in a side-by-side -side scenario with different structures to them. Now that we have those tools in place, we'll take a look at the break-even type of analysis, which is a common midpoint, and it's gonna be helping us to answer some questions when we're trying to compare whether or not it'd be beneficial to purchase points in an individual loan, and possibly whether or not it'd be beneficial or what would be the best scenario if we were to be comparing different loan structures in the event that we do not expect to have the loan for the entire period of the loan. So in other words, if we look at our information on the left-hand side, we have the 200,000 home value. We're not gonna put anything down just for our practice problem purposes here so that we have the 200,000 loan. So in essence, starting point, $200,000 loan, years, 30 year, months, 360, 30 times 12. In other words, the rate, is going to be the five percent that's going to be our starting point and then we're going to think about adding the points which you'll recall basically means that we're going to be buying points in our instance here points mean for every point you're going to be getting one percent of the loan in terms of the upfront cost that means two hundred thousand dollar loan if that was our loan times 0.01 percent would be a decrease or would be a cost of two thousand per point and so, and then you would get a decrease. What you're benefiting or getting from that is a rate decrease. The rate decrease could vary. We're gonna say it's 0.25% for each point that was purchased here. And that's, gonna, that's going to have an impact on the rate. It does not have an impact if you were to purchase points, even though you'll be paying something upfront, one point costing 2000 in our example, it does not impact the amount of the loan balance and so that's where kind of the confusion comes in because you end up with this scenario where you have a lower rate possibly because you paid down the rate, but you have this fee, in essence, the points that are happening upfront, in essence, a prepayment of the interest. Now that if it can be a little bit confusing to compare then as to whether it be beneficial to have the points or not. In other words, is the lower rate beneficial compared to the upfront payment that you have to make? And then two, how could you make a comparison from that loan structure to other loan structures which have a different kind of point breakout structure or possibly no points and a different rate to them? The first thing that we would think of to make that comparison is to look at some kind of ratio, some kind of statistic, some kind of percent that can do the comparison in a similar way as we would do any kind of comparison with like a performance thing, like job performance, if we're measuring a basketball player's free throw percentage or a baseball player's on bat percentages. They have different shots of free throws, different on bat chances. Therefore, we would have to use some ratio which can give us an idea of a comparison between one or the other. That's what we would like to do here, comparing those two items into one kind of percent number. That number we calculated up here being the effective rate in prior presentations, which in essence calculates the rate, but takes into consideration on the on the present value the loan amount minus the amount we paid for the points so that's going to be our first tool that helps us to do comparisons as to whether or not it'd be beneficial to take the points or not and if it's a lower rate than the rate without typically it would be good if you had the loan for the entire time period in this case 30 years but it's going to be and it also is a good rate to compare to other loans if you do a similar method with other loans that are structured differently you can use that rate for a comparison in a similar way as you can use a batting average you know as a comparison between two different batters that had different at bats or different free throw percentage rates and whatnot for different players and whatnot so same kind of concept there but we have this issue that what if we are getting a 30-year loan 
However, we do not expect to have the loan for 30 years. We only expect to have it for five years or something like that. Then this effective rate that we calculate will actually differ throughout the loan term. And that's where the complexity comes in. That's what we'll get into now. Now, it's nice to know what we would call the break-even point to first think about that. There's two ways you can go about that problem. One is you could say, hey, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to sell this home or I'm going to sell this property. I'm going to, and the loan's going to be ending. Even though I took a 30-year loan, I'm only going to have it for three years. If you know the, the end point, then you can calculate this effective rate as of the three-year point, even though it's a 30-year loan. And that's a little bit easier. Or you could say, well, what is that break-even point? What, how long would I have to have this loan in order for this to break even? In other words, from a financial standpoint, have the points be equal to the without points. And so that's a little bit more difficult. There's a kind of an easy method and then a little more precise method that we can kind of figure that out with. That's going to be our objective. So this is going to be the starting point where we've got the 17364 without the points involved here. And you can see that we have our loan up top. We've got the payments that would be calculating out we have the higher payments than we would if we had the points. That's one of the major benefits with the points. If we lower or pay down the interest rate, we will typically come to a lower payment, which is mostly the primary objective for most times when we're buying the points for budgeting purposes. We got 360 loan here at the bottom of the 360 loan. We come up to zero, so we've calculated our, our amortization table that way. Then we could copy and paste this in Excel, and we do work this in Excel if you want to work this practice problem in Excel, and compare it to an amortization table where we have points. And if we add the points, we're going to say, all right, well, let's say we got three points, and the three points are going to cost us, a point means 1% of the loan, 200,000 times 0.01 would be 2,000 per point times three, 6,000. So we're going to pay 6,000 upfront. Remember that 6,000 is not included in the loan balance in terms of when we calculate the loan it's just going to be paid over and above the loan that's where it gets kind of confusing and so if we get that six thousand what are we going to get in our scenario we're going to say 0.25 decrease per point so we're going to get 0.25 decrease times three points 0.75 minus five percent we're going to get a rate we pay down the rate to 4.25 so it cost us six thousand to pay down the rate 0.75% from 5% down to 4.25. Now, the, if I look at the effective rate, I'm going to get to something that's that's going to be higher than that. It's going to be 4.508. That's the effective rate over the entire loan. Why is it higher? Because I would calculate the present, the, the rate, but instead of using the value of 200,000, which is the loan value, the flow up front is actually 200,000 minus what we paid, 6,000. So it's actually 194 that we paid up in time period zero that we have. So if we roll that in to our present value type of calculation over the entire 30 years, we come up to an effective rate of the 4.508. That's lower than 5%. So you would think that it would be beneficial to do so if you were to hold the loan for the entire period and if you can afford the 6,000 upfront and you get the benefit, of course, of the lower payments as well. So this would be the amortization table uh, with the points. Now the question is, well, this, this rate, however, which is basically the IRR, internal rate of return, will basically differ due to this upfront thing being different than the loan amount each time period. So where's the break even? If I put 6,000 upfront, when, at what point in time, will I be beneficial from a financial standpoint in order to recover the cost that I put down in essence upfront? couple ways to do it. There's a, there's a basic kind of calculation that's not exactly precise. And the reason it's not completely precise is because when you sell the home, this ending balance is going to be different. You're still going to have, to, or whatever the property is, the home, the property, you're still going to have to pay off the ending balance. That's where it gets a little confusing. So let's compare these two side by side. Here's the item without points. Here's the item with points. Without points, we've got the 5%. We've got the amount of payment, 1,073.64 with points. We got the three points, $6,000 up front in order to get the payment down to the 983.88 with a rate of 4.25 and then the effective rate 4.508. So the effective rate showing that you would think it would be better over the life of the loan. Now let's do our break-even point. This is how you would typically see the break-even point if you, if you look up. How do you calculate the break-even point? It would say, this is how much you're paying for the points 
And the question would be, well, based on the difference in the payments, when am I going to make up that just in total dollars on payment terms? So in other words, if I didn't have points, I'm paying 1074 If I have points, I'm paying 984 about. These are rounded. So the difference between those two, 1074 minus the 984 is going to be $90. So if I'm, if I'm saving $90 per month and it costs me $6,000 up front, then 6,000 divided by 90 means that after 67 payments about, or in other words, if I t that's per month. And if I take that and I divide it by 12, after about 5.5 years about, then we would have recovered that 6,000 just in terms of payments. Now that's a pretty good rough number, but it's still not exactly you know accurate in terms of what would happen if you actually basically sold the home or sold the property at that point in time because you're still going to have a difference because of the difference in loan amounts what's what the actual ending balance is in the loan due to this to the different interest rates so that gives you you know a good idea you could say well you know if i'm going to have if i plan on selling the home in like two years then then it might not it's not generally going to be beneficial to put the six thousand up front because i'm not going to even i'm not going to even recover it just in terms of total dollars generally at that point in time if i sell it if i'm if i'm going to hold on to it for like something substantially over this 5.5 years, like 10 years or something like that in this case, then we could say, well, then it's pretty, looks pretty, we could be pretty confident that we're past the point where it would be financially beneficial as long as it's everything else works out. Meaning, you know, there's a lot of factors involved. You might just want the, the nine, the smaller rate and whatnot, or the smaller payments. But in any case, so that's a pretty good number, but it's not completely exact and let's just kind of break out let's use our tools to try to hunt for that basically break even point using the IRR calculation so let's say let's say we have our points here and this is going to be our calculation with points now if we had no points and you do our present value calculation it shouldn't really matter what day you you pick in order to calculate the interest rate on a normal loan that doesn't have that front that front loaded component that isn't included in the loan, you should get 5%. Whether you do the internal rate of return, basically all the way down, you should you should get around you know the same 5%. So the question is on this one, where you had the points involved, and we tried to figure out the effective rate, that effective rate will differ due to this first number being, being different than the actual amount that's being amortized in the loan. So that means, so what we would like to do is find you know, where would this IRR calculation, if I was to take the sum of the payment using the tools we looked at in the prior presentation, where would that IRR come out to be 5%, which you would expect to be in essence, the break even point. Now, if I use the calculation that we got in our break even, we got 67 payments, right? If I use 67 here, that's what we got on our break even, 67 point. So if I go and if I go down my amortization table, right? Here's my amortization table and I went down to that point 67, you can put a green line there. You could say, okay, that then, here's my ending loan balance, and there's that point 67 in around six years. Now, if I look at the cash flow, I've got the 194 up front because that represents the, the 200,000 that we got that we then paid for the home with minus the 6,000 that we had to put up front for the points. And then we've got the outflow, which represents the payments that we we're making after the points at that 4.25 rate on the 200,000, the full loan amount. And th this cash flow works similarly to our calculation, but the problem is down here at period 67, we have the amount that we paid, the, the, nine, the 984, but we also have the balance of the loan, meaning if we sold the property at that point, then of course we'd have to pay off the loan balance. And that's where the kind of the wrinkle is in this whole scenario, because the loan balance is gonna be different between the two scenarios because we calculated two different interest rates on it. So in other words, if you looked at that 67 period in our amortization table up here and we went down to that period 67 and said, what really happens? Well, if I sold the home, there's going to be an outflow with regards to the loan. Hopefully we would get money, right? But we're not talking about the revenue side. We're, just, we're talking about the loan component. We would have a loan balance of 179205. 179205 after we pay the balance during that time period which was the 984 about so plus the 984 so we'd have an outflow of about 180 
uh, 189. So that's where the little twist comes in here if you're trying to get a little bit more exact here. So we'd have an outflow at that last point, 180189. So if I was if I was to add this up, we'd get the cash flow of the 51125 and the internal rate of return comes out to be 4.9 if I was to take the flow of these data stopping it at 0.6 at 67 periods instead of 360 and you'll note that that's not quite 5%, right, which we you would think would be our kind of break even point in terms of time value of money and it's also not the effective rate, the effective rate that we calculated up top if we had the entire loan which was 4.5%, 4.508. So if we stop the loan at 60, 67, which was our break-even point with our kind of kind of basic calculation, it's you know a pretty good number, but it's really IRR is about 4.9 at that point in time. And then you might try to hunt around and say, well, when would the IRR be at at 5%? And you can kind of move up on the payments here to figure out when the IRR would be about 5%, which would be, you would think, more exact. Now, to do this, it's kind of tedious to do even in Excel because basically you have to figure out what the ending balance is. I'd have to guess up here and say, well, what about at like 62? What would be the loan balance at that point? And then calculate the IRR, getting it closer to 5%. And then you can go up here. If we go up here to 57, you get pretty close here. And I calculate the 5 then I get to 5%. So if you do some trial and error, you can do your basic your basic break even, find that, say, okay, I'm close. And then if you wanted to get more specific, you can kind of hunt around and say, okay, I'm going to recalculate this ending balance, you know, a few periods up, a few periods up until I get to an IRR, which would be 5%, which you would think would be a little bit more exact. So it's pretty close, right? You would think around around this payment on on 56 at the payment is pretty close let's bring this up so it lines up here 56 is right there so that's pretty close down here but it's not you know the exact number and it could it could differ you know more greatly depending on what your what your circumstances are so it may or may not be something that would be relevant but in any case if i stopped here at 60 at 56 if i looked at my amortization schedule and said all right let's test it out and and move it on up to like 56 up here that means my balance at the end there that i would have to pay off if i was to like sell the sell the property at that point pay off the loan i'm not talking about the proceeds from the property just paying off the loan would be 182966 plus we'd have to pay off that 984 about payment so about 183950 about 183950 then if we scroll on down would be that last that last amount totaling that up we'd get to the 4465 and then if i take the irr the internal rate of return of this series of payments i get five percent around five percent it might be still rounded there but that's going to be the that's going to be the idea so that you would think would be a little bit more precise in terms of the value than than the break-even point here although again it's pretty close and it could be your your starting point uh, if you're doing comparisons give you a good good rough number so then, you know, if you if you compare these two out, and I was to compare the items, this is the item that has the 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 points involved, and this is the cash flow that does not have the points involved. Meaning we had the two hundred thousand upfront, and then the payments were one thousand seventy four, and I calculate it down to that point where I believe is the break even point. If we have the fifty six payment. Then we have the total here. If we sum up the payments, the actual cash cash flow after the 56 uh, months, and we get pretty close, right? We got 44.063 minus the 45.002. We got a difference in total cash flow over that time frame of 939. And then also, if if you take into consideration time value of money, which you know is part of the part because we have a difference in terms of when things were paid, right? This one had 190 for upfront inflow versus the 200,000 which you have a time value of money kind of difference there so that means but the IRR calculation then is basically at that 5% which would be a fairly good indication of it being kind of that center point so if you're thinking about not holding on to the property for a long period of time you could try to use that as a basically a point in time to decide whether points are going to be beneficial to you or not and again if you plan on having the property only up until like period 30 or something here, 
then you can calculate the IRR more specifically, basically as of that point in time, which makes it maybe even easier to, to do calculations uh, with different loan scenarios. So this is one more way to look at it, just to add the sales price, because oftentimes you're thinking, well, if I hold it for a certain amount of period and I sell it, that people get the revenue in, involved with the with the process as well, because we're really only talking about the loan here, but just to see it on a sales term, which might make it click for some people more. If you say, okay, if, what if I sold it after 0.67? So at 0.67, that's the break even we did without the IRR, which is a little further down. If we sold it here, and then we'll do the same thing if we sold it up top. The issue is this ending balance is gonna be different between the two the two payments, which is a little a little bit of a wrinkle there. So what if I sold it for 200,000? That's what we purchased it for, we're saying. So the original amount, we get money, cash in, of the 200,000 for the one with no points. The loan amount then is the 181471 versus if we had the points, the loan amount is the 179205. We'd have to pay off these loan amounts that are there after that amount of payments from the proceeds from the 200,000 that we get. So in other words, if I come down here, we got we got the 179205 uh, that we'd have to pay off versus the 181471. So there we have those. And then if we subtract those two out, these would be the proceeds after we pay off the loan. So if we sold it for 200,000, we'd have to pay off the loan. These would be the proceeds after after the loan. So I'm not calculating the gain here, which would be considering the cost. As, as well, I'm just looking at the proceeds after we pay off the loan. The difference between the two being the 2,266. Uh, and then up front, we had to pay 6,000 on the points, which we did not pay over here, right? We only looked at the, at the proceeds and the loan balance. Loan balance didn't include the 6,000. So here we had another 6,000 that we had to put in. That means if we, we take the net of the 6,000 that we had, we've got the 18, 529 versus the 17795 on the proceeds difference between the proceeds at that point the 3734 now if we think about how much cash we had actually paid in terms of simply payments that we made we already calculated the cost up top now if we just look at the payments that we made here on the first one we've got the the 11074 about times we had 67 payments times 67, that's not six, 67. We've got about 71934 versus the second one where we paid this 984, 984 times 67 payments. We got about the, the 65920 about. So we got a difference in the payments that we made. These are cash outflows just in terms of the payments of the 6,000 uh, 14. So if we look at the net proceeds minus the, the cash flow here, we've got the 3734 minus the 6014. We've got a difference of 2,280. That's that we basically just did the cash flow again, but sometimes if you add in the sales, it, it kind of that factor kind of helps. Otherwise, people get kind of confused on the sales sometimes and try to put that in. Now, if I do the same thing for the for the period 56 saying we sold it for the two th 200,000 and then the loan amount at that point so now we're talking about the light green was 184878 versus 182996 that would give us proceeds after those loan balances we sell it for that amount we pay off the loan we got 15 122 17034 here's the difference we had to pay for the points on the second one there's the points. We got the net proceeds, 15, 122, 11, 0, 3, 4 at that point. And then we could think about, okay, what were the payments that we had to make up to that point? Well, we had in this point, we had the payments over here were about 1074 times. Now we're talking 56 payments. That would be about 6144 about. And over here, we're talking 984 times 56 55 about because it's rounded here so the difference between those two would be 5027 and then if we took our our net balance 4088 minus the 5027 we get that 939 
This is the same amount we got with the cash flow. We basically just did kind of the cash flow again, but again, sometimes just adding the revenue, it basically it basically could could click a little bit more. So that's the same difference we got up here when we just subtracted out the cash flows between the two scenarios, the nine the nine three nine. So you can see this one's a little bit a little bit closer, and that IRR could be a tool that could be useful as you do you know multiple kind of comparisons. So again, if we, we do this in Excel, if you want to kind of play with these numbers in Excel, we put this worksheet together. We also have the worksheet put together if you'd like to use it, if you think it would be useful for your, your personal decision-making processes.